Hi there, it's uh, time for episode two of The Holy Life. And uh, as I said uh, last time, uh, I'm going to be doing it in front of uh, the fireplace. We have a nice uh, fire going uh, today and it smells great. Uh, you'll hear it uh, crackling in the background there uh, as we go through our lesson uh, today. And um, I'm praying that um, you learn some very, very valuable things about um, what it means to live a holy life in Jesus Christ. And um, so as we get started today, uh, we're going to um, talk about uh, several things um, and I want to read a couple of scriptures uh, to get our minds uh, focused uh, on what it is we're talking about today. Uh, last time we heard the Apostle Peter um, saying that uh, you and I uh, were to be holy in everything we do. And that's what the Apostles mean. Uh, this uh, particular series is all about how that happens operationally. Uh, sometimes we sing songs uh, or we have sermons about holiness and the holiness of God, but uh, there is not enough teaching and training about um, how this holiness process works and how the holiness of God takes hold of you and I um, on the inside and wholly transforms our living, our thinking, our behavior, our perspective. Um, and uh, all of this is taught very, very clearly by Jesus and the apostles. And so we're going to uh, look at a whole set of scriptures um, that um, help us to see just how all this connects up and how it is that you and I are supposed to become holy as we are walking with the one who is holy. We're learning this holy living from him, Jesus the Christ. Now, in 1 Peter uh, chapter 1, uh, verse 15 and 16, the uh, last time we read, uh, but now you must be holy in everything you do. And uh, that Greek word for everything means everything. Um, and this is where our discussion starts uh, because there has been uh, some erroneous teaching about what it means to be in Christ Jesus, what it means to come into the kingdom of God. And uh, we, most of us, know uh, how you come into the kingdom of God because Jesus talked about it in John 3. He did it to demonstrate for us how it works in his baptism in Matthew 3. And uh, so the Apostle Peter is saying, but now, now that you or I, or I, both of us, all of us are in Christ, we must be holy in everything you do, just as God who chose you is holy. For the scriptures say, you must be holy because I am holy. And this word is everything, and the word is must. You and I must be holy as he is holy. Now, sometimes uh, this is taught in terms of you and I having a position of righteousness, being covered with the righteousness of Christ, uh, when we have been baptized into him, the way the apostles taught and practiced uh, uniformly throughout the New Testament, um, you and I... Uh, are basically given new life in Christ. The life of Christ becomes our life. And the old self dies, the Apostle Paul says in Romans 6. That old person dies. And we are uh, resurrected uh, to walk anew, to a new life in Jesus Christ, where his life, his character, his spirit dominates who we are, and how we live every single day. Um, that's the way it's taught by Jesus and the apostles. And so 
uh, we start seeing how all of these things line up between Paul and Peter and John, um, it becomes exceedingly clear um, what it is you and I are supposed to be doing in this holiness process. Um, Jesus himself in John 17, 17, in his prayer, says, Make them holy by your truth. Teach them your word, which is the truth. Uh, the Holy Spirit is called the Spirit of Truth, the Spirit of Grace. Uh, he uh, is the one who was guiding the apostles into all truth, courtesy of Jesus having the Holy Spirit sent uh, and poured out on them to, to unleash uh, the kingdom of God to establish uh, the church. And... Um, so uh, in 1 John 4, 13, John says, God has given us his spirit as proof that we live in him and he in us. Now that's pretty clear, 1 John 4, 13. God has given us his spirit as proof that we live in him and he in us. Us. This fits exactly with what Jesus said in John 14. Um, it also fits with what Jesus was talking uh, to the woman at the well about in John 4, in terms of the kind of spiritual worship that would be uh, the new worship, uh, the new form of worship in the new uh, kingdom um, in this, uh, under this new covenant uh, of Christ. Um, so... A lot of this takes us back to uh, some of the early uh, teachings in the Old Testament where um, Jesus quotes Deuteronomy, uh, even in Matthew 4, um, he's quoting Deuteronomy, and he says, Worship the Lord your God and only the Lord your God. Serve him with absolute single-mindedness. CNLT. Uh, this is what Jesus is saying in the desert as he is being uh, tempted, tested by Satan directly. Uh, this is very, very clear what he is saying, uh, just as what he prayed for in John 17 is very clear. Um, and um, we see uh, a couple of other things that, uh, that help us uh, to understand just what this means. Um, Jesus... Um, in his early teachings uh, on the mount uh, in particular uh, in matthew 5 8 he's he's actually telling people very uh, explicitly that only if they have a pure heart can they see god they will never see god unless they have a pure heart and the wording is cada uh, roi en cardia those who are unmixed, kadaroi, unmixed, unmingled, uh, single, single-minded, uh, singular focus in their hearts. And that singular focus is on God, worshiping only God, loving God with all of who you are at all times above everything else not giving more attention to other things on the earth than you do to God. And this is an operational test for us because some days uh, we are not doing what Jesus Christ is talking about. Uh, we're not doing what Jesus Christ did. Uh, he put the Father above all else and he started out his day submitting to the Father in all things. And uh, that's why he is talking about uh, and praying for uh, when the kingdom makes it possible uh, for the will of God to be done on earth as it is in heaven. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. This is Jesus' uh, approach as he comes bringing the kingdom of God. Um, now, something that uh, Thomas Akempis, the writer of The Imitation of Christ, back in the 1400s said, uh, struck me. He said, Behold my God and my all. What would I have more 
And what greater happiness can I desire? Uh, this is something to reflect on because it, it, it is totally uh, what Jesus was talking about um, as he was being tested and as he was praying uh, different times. This is what Jesus was talking about. Um, no greater desire than for God. Uh, we are told later in uh, that same passage, uh, both Matthew and Luke record it, saying, uh, um, you know, to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, the righteousness that we're talking about, the holiness of God, to seek it above all else, before everything else. That's the point of that verse. Matthew 6, 33. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness above all else. That's what we're talking about in this whole series. Uh, Augustine uh, noted something. Uh, he said the whole life of the good Christian is a holy longing, a longing for God. Um, remember that psalm about the deer panting for water, thirsting for water? Uh, remember Jesus talking uh, Again, uh, on the mount and in other places, uh, totally about this, about hungering and thirsting for righteousness, hungering for God, for the holiness of God, thirsting for the holiness of God. And Jesus talks to the woman at the well in John 4 about thirsting for this water, this everlasting water. And then he makes reference to it in terms of the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit of God welling up into eternal life. So you see the connections already. Um, the, the other thing that uh, Augustine talks about, which I also thought was interesting because C.S. Lewis um, uh, wrote about this quite a bit, and we'll, we'll talk about that too. Uh, he said, my soul is like a house Small for you, speaking to God. My soul is like a house. That's John 14. Jesus said, the Father and I will come and make residence in your house, in your oikos, in, in your heart. The heart is the home now of God, the temple of God, according to this New Testament. My soul is like a house, small for you to enter, but I pray you in, I pray you to enlarge it. It is in ruins, but I ask you to remake it. Remember the C.S. Lewis uh, writing where he was talking about how uh, the soul of man is like a house which has been condemned and uh, sometimes you and I, as that house, feel like, oh, we, we need some tweaking. We need, uh, we need to flip the bathroom, maybe, uh, part of the kitchen, but not much else. We're, we're in pretty good shape. But the Holy Spirit of God comes in when you and I are baptized into Christ. We receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit of God is like the general contractor for this holiness process. Uh, he is the sanctifying Spirit of God. And uh, so when he comes in uh, to dwell in us, the Father and Son dwelling in us through the Holy Spirit, according to John 14, you and I uh, sometimes uh, think that we are in better shape on the inside than we actually are. But the Holy Spirit, being the general contractor of the project, starts assessing, and he starts seeing things in the corner and all the nooks and crannies, and he goes up into the attic, and there's a lot of junk up there. It's a fire hazard. He goes into the basement, and the foundation is pitiful. Uh, there almost is no foundation, really. How is the house still standing? We don't know. 
And he comes in and he has to replace the foundation. Jesus Christ is the foundation. Everything has to be built on him, on what he says. Everything has to be built on the foundation of Jesus Christ. Not old stuff mixed with the new. A whole new foundation so that the house will go solid. Luke 6.40. This is what Jesus taught. And he's in there and he's doing work and he realizes, oh my goodness, this is a mess. This person is a mess inside. This house is a wreck. We've got to clean all this stuff out. And we have to remake the whole house, rebuild the whole house. The structure is bad. Everything's rotted. And everything has to be made new. And he starts to work. He starts the work. God has initiated the work in you through faith. And he is going to finish the work in you by his power, through your faith. This is what the Hebrew writer says. So God has a lot to do uh, inside of us, remaking us to become like Christ, to have the image increasingly of Christ, the way the Hebrew writer explains. This is uh, a big process, and only God is up to it. This is no tweaking matter. This is no little pasting on of badges of fruit and virtues. This is a total reconstruction of your soul. This is what you and I are called to in Jesus Christ. Holiness. A holy life, just as Peter was saying. In 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 11, it says, Since everything around us is going to be destroyed like this, he's talking about the end of things, what holy and godly lives you should live. This earth is going to be destroyed. Everything that you and I maybe have gotten attached to is going to be destroyed. And the only thing that will last is your soul. Your soul. What is going on inside of your soul? Are you and I really living this holy and godly life that Peter is talking about? He says, looking forward to the day of God and hurrying it along. Are you and I anxious, excited? about the day that Christ returns, the way the apostles taught, all the apostles taught this, all of them. And John reminds us to be faithful until death. Jesus Christ will come back for his holy people, and he will finish this holiness process. And when we see him, we will be like him, it says in the word of God. In 2 Peter, chapter 2, verse 17 through 22, it says, They promise freedom, uh, freedom but they themselves are slaves to sin and corruption. Uh, this is a problem when this is happening in terms of preachers and teachers, uh, leaders. For you are a slave to whatever controls you, the Apostle Peter teaches. You're a slave to whatever controls you. And this has something to do with addictions. But even more so than that, our thinking, all of our thought process, is to come under the sovereignty of God and his Holy Spirit. This is talked about in Galatians, and we'll get to that. He continues, And when people escape from the wickedness of the world by knowing our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and then get tangled up and enslaved by sin again, they're worse off than before. It would be better if they had never known the way to righteousness than to know it and then reject the command they were given to live a holy life. 
2 Peter chapter 2, 17 through 22. Spend some time looking at this, staring at this, and praying about it, because he is saying something most serious to you and I. Uh, sometimes we have a very superficial approach to Christianity, and it is, is of no use to God. Uh, sitting in a pew, thinking a few good thoughts, praying a few times during the week, and then not really being involved with God in this very personal, devotional holiness process every single day is a serious problem. So the Apostle Peter is getting our attention. He's saying that we were commanded to live a holy life. And you and I need to fully comprehend what this means. Uh, you heard what he said. <laughs> uh, everything is writing on this. What I'm talking about to you right now, everything in terms of your eternal destiny is writing on how you and I comprehend, put into full operation through our submission to God each day, uh, how we apply the truth of God every single day, the words of Jesus every single day, is the key, is the key. Uh, because we are, according to Peter, the holy people of God. We can't be fighting against the Holy Spirit. We have to be doing what the Holy Spirit is leading us to do. Galatians chapter 5, all the way through. We'll spend some time. So the holy life is big. It's big, and it will enlarge us. There's no doubt about that. Uh, a lot of Christians are living tiny little lives. Some people want a tiny footprint. Well, spiritually, you don't. Spiritually, you want a big footprint. You want to be walking in the footprints of Jesus Christ, the biggest shoes ever, the Holy One. You and I are supposed to become like Him. And one of the biggest lies in history, a lie straight from Satan to Christians, is that you and I can never be holy like Jesus. This holiness process is a waste of time because it's not possible to be like Jesus. I've had Christians look at me and actually say, oh, of course, Jesus, he's, he's totally perfect. No, you know, nobody can be like that. So it's almost like we'll, we'll just not try. We'll do a couple of nice things here and there and, and hope for the best. Not the teaching of Jesus and the apostles. Not at all. Not at all. Incorrect. And in fact, we're going to find out from Scripture repeatedly repeatedly, that when somebody tells you we're all sinners, if he's talking about people who are in Christ Jesus, he's wrong. That person is wrong. Yeah, because everyone who is in Christ is no longer condemned. They are not sinners anymore. They are the holy people of God. It's not semantics. Jesus Christ didn't die in order for people to stay sinners and up their hope factor. That's incorrect. Bad theology all the way around. So what the Apostle John taught, we are going to study closely. And he taught that you and I cannot continue in sin. We'll look at that in 1 John. You and I, all of those who are in Christ Jesus, cannot continue in sin. We cannot continue to practice sin. Now, if we say we never ever sin, then we're not telling the truth because we do sin, but we're in Christ Jesus. It's not just positional theology, it's operational. I am being made holy by the Holy Spirit of God because I am in Christ now. The righteousness of Christ covers me now. We are clothed with the righteousness of Christ now, operationally, effectively, for real in the eyes of God. We are no longer sinners. It's a demarcation point. That old person is crucified. That old person doesn't exist anymore, according to God. 
You're a new person, and Christ lives in you. It's not I, but Christ living in me. That's the mystery of the gospel. That is the power of the gospel that we're not to be ashamed of. The power of the gospel. So you and I have a lot to digest, a lot to study, a lot to pray about in order to really obey God and do what the Apostle Peter is saying. Take a look at uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 16 through 18. Whenever someone turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. The veil, mm -hmm. yeah. For the Lord is the Spirit. There you go. The Lord is the Spirit. And wherever the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. What were you set free from? Why did Jesus Christ die for you? To set you free from sin and death. The explicit teaching of the apostles. To set you free from sin and death. So if you've been baptized into Jesus Christ, what are you? You are holy and you are set free. You are free in Christ. Free indeed, Jesus himself says. Free indeed because the Son has freed you. Because you responded to his truth. You are set free from sin and death. The power of sin, the power of death, no longer in force over you because you belong to Jesus the Christ who overcame them. Okay? That's what the Messiah was coming to do. He was coming to reconcile all things so that you and I can be holy in the sight of God. So, according to what Jesus was talking about in Matthew 5, 8, we're staying focused, we're being single-minded, our hearts uh, are being focused completely on loving God every second of every day. And as we see in Jesus' own life, his living every day was a series of holy moments. Even when he had to be frank with people, he had to correct people. Uh, even when he was telling people to repent, he was doing it out of love because this holiness was being brought to bear in the kingdom of God. The kingdom was near. He was bringing the kingdom that would be everlasting that Daniel prophesied about. So this veil is taken away. The Lord is there. Wherever the Lord is, there is freedom. So all of us who have had the veil removed, everybody who's been baptized into Christ Jesus, clothed with Christ now, can see and reflect the glory of the Lord. And the Lord, who is the Spirit, one more time, makes us more and more like him as we are changed into his glorious image. Some versions say increasingly into the image of his son. So is this a try harder thing? No, it's not a try harder thing. Uh, it is a stay focused on Jesus thing. But it's all about the power of God being brought, brought to bear on those that he has freed and brought into his holiness. The holy of holies, the God of the universe, living inside of us. You are the temple of the Holy Spirit of God. Peter says that we are a temple being lifted up together, a temple of the living God. This is the new covenant. This is the the way that the New Testament is talked about and New Testament worship is talked about by Jesus and the apostles throughout the text. So God is doing it. Just as the Hebrew passage says, God is the one who has the power to transform us. His Holy Spirit of love is transforming us. The Spirit of grace is transforming us. He is transforming us, changing us increasingly into the likeness of His Son. Now, it's an ongoing process, and you and I, you know, we're human beings. We're, we're, we're not going to be fully consistent, but that's not the point. The point is we are giving ourselves completely to God every day, and uh, that is our task 
That is our task. Uh, serving God, not the world. You cannot serve God and the world. James says you cannot be friends with the world because it makes you an enemy of God. Uh, there is tremendous clarity, a binary clarity throughout the Word of God that sometimes today people do not want to accept. But God is a God of order. He is a God of clarity. And he wants you to understand his holiness as well as, as humanly possible uh, as you walk uh, with the Holy One, as the Holy Shepherd of God shepherds you every single day. Uh, just like Psalm 23 says. Uh, 2 Corinthians 7 1 says this Let us work toward complete holiness because we fear God. Now, Paul talks about this uh, several different times about fearing God, about uh, God being a consuming fire, and also his kindness and his sternness to, together, going together. It has to do with his holy justice, his holy character. So he is loving, but he is just. He has compassion. His, faith, his, his love is unfailing. It's faithful. But he is just in his righteousness, his holiness. And you and I uh, need to fear God in order for this holiness process to be completed. And that's the wording that Paul uses to the Corinthians in his second letter. Um, the Galatians uh, 6, 8 passage, uh, right after the Galatians 5 chapter, which is a pivotal point that we'll go to, uh, Galatians 6, 8 says, Those who live to please the Spirit, the Spirit of God living inside of you, indwelling you, will harvest everlasting life from the Spirit. Now that's exactly what Jesus said in John. He said this too, that the, that the Holy Spirit of God would be uh, welling up. Uh, it's a spring in the heart. It'll be welling up to eternal life. Um, this is what the Apostle Paul is talking about. So you and I are supposed to uh, plant seeds, uh, to work every day, uh, really planting the seeds uh, uh, the truth of God which is planted in us the Apostle Paul says the word is planted in us uh, we need to spend a lot of time in the word of God much more time than we probably are right now you want to become holy uh, you start reading every passage in the Bible it has to do with uh, the word holy or holiness and uh, you'll begin to learn something important um, those who live to please the Spirit will harvest everlasting life from the Spirit. Um, this everlasting life that Jesus Christ promises uh, comes to us in this way because we are focused completely on Him and we are surrendered to the Spirit of God just as He showed us from His baptism on. Um, this, is, this is the relationship for which you and I were saved. Uh, the holy God has made a way for us in Christ Jesus to become holy as he is holy. Thank you so much for joining me in this series, and I'll continue to be praying for you and um, praying that this holiness process uh, really does begin to take hold uh, in you and the holy love of God begins to fully envelop you uh, throughout each day. Um, and I'm just praying that, uh, that you will pay attention uh, to the word of God, the words of, of Jesus, and, uh, and submit yourself completely uh, to God in every way as you are studying uh, all of this. Thank you for being with me today. And uh, next time we'll see uh, if I can uh, get the fireplace uh, actually in the picture completely. Um, it's still crackling, but it's gone down. Okay, next time um, we'll get the fire going again. Thank you so much for being with me. And uh, you stay strong and uh, do a lot of study. Do a lot of praying. Pray to God about this holiness uh, that he means for you, that he has freed you to. And um, I'll be praying for you. All righty. Thank you. God bless you. Bye-bye.